David, the biggest secret, introduction. Days of decision. We are on the cusp of an incredible global change. A crossroads where we make decisions which will influence life on earth well into the future of what we call time. We can fling open the doors of the mental and emotional prisons which have confined the human race for thousands of years. Or we can allow the agents of that control to complete their agenda for the mental, emotional, spiritual and physical enslavement of every man, woman and child on the planet with a world government, army, central bank and currency, underpinned by a microchipped population. I know that sounds fantastic. But if the human race lifted its eyes from the latest soap opera or game show for long enough to engage its brain, it would see that these events are not just going to happen, they are happening. The momentum for the centralized control of global politics, business, banking, military and media is gathering pace by the hour. The microchipping of people is already being suggested and, in many cases, underway. Whenever a hidden agenda is about to be implemented there is always the period when the hidden has to break the surface for the final push into physical reality. This is what we are seeing now in the explosion of mergers between global banking and business empires, and the speed at which political and economic control is being centralized through the European Union, the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, the Multilateral Agreement on Investment and the stream of other globalizing bodies like the World Bank, International Monetary Fund and the G7-G8 summits. Behind this constant and coordinated centralization is a tribe of interbreeding bloodlines which can be traced to the ancient Middle and Near East. They emerged from there to become the royalty, aristocracy and priesthood of Europe before expanding their power across the world, largely through the Great British Empire. This allowed the tribe to export its bloodlines to all the countries the British and European powers occupied, including the United States where they continue to run the show to this day. There have been just over 40 presidents of the United States and 33 of them have been genetically related to two people, England's King Alfred the Great and Charlemagne, the famous monarch in 9th century France. Throughout this whole period the agenda of this bloodline has been gradually implemented until we have reached the point today where centralized global control is possible. If you want to know what life will be like unless we wake up fast, take a look at Nazi Germany. That is the world that awaits the global population as the plan I call the Brotherhood Agenda unfolds across the year 2000 and into the first 12 years of the new century. 2012 particularly appears to be a crucial year for reasons we shall discuss. People have no idea of the abyss we are staring into or the nature of the world we are leaving for our children to endure and most people don't seem to care. They would much rather ignore the obvious and go into denial of a truth that's splatting them between the eyes. I feel like the cow who runs into the field screaming, Hey, you know that truck that takes some of our friends away every month? Well they don't take them to another field like we thought. They shoot them in the head, bleed them dry, cut them up, and put the pieces into packets. Then those humans buy them and eat them. Imagine what the reaction of the rest of the herd would be, you're crazy man. They'd never do that. Anyway, I've got shares in the trucking company and I get a good return. Shut up, you're making waves. The agenda I am exposing has been unfolding over thousands of years to its current point close to completion because humanity has given away its mind and its responsibility. Humanity would rather do what it thinks is right for itself in the moment than consider the wider consequences of its behavior for human existence. Ignorance is bliss, we say, and that's true, but only for a while. It may be bliss not to know a tornado is coming because you have no need to worry or take action. But while your head is in the sand your bum is in the air, the tornado is still coming. If you looked up and faced it, disaster could be avoided, but ignorance and denial always ensure that you will get the full force and the most extreme consequences, because it strikes when least expected and you are least prepared. Like I say, ignorance is bliss, but only for so long. We create our own reality by our thoughts and actions. For every action or non-action there is a consequence. When we give our minds and our responsibility away we give our lives away. If enough of us do it, we give the world figure 1, 
knowledge is in the hands of the away and that is precisely what we have been doing few and the rest are kept ignorant. The throughout known human history. This is why the classic structure for manipulation and few have always controlled the masses. The only control. Difference today is that the few are now manipulating the entire planet because of the globalization of business, banking and communications. The foundation of that control has always been the same, keep the people in ignorance, fear and at war with themselves. Divide, rule and conquer while keeping the most important knowledge to yourself, see figure 1. And as we shall see in this book, those who have used these methods to control humanity for thousands of years are members of the same force, the same interbreeding tribe, following a long-term agenda which is now reaching a major point on its journey. The global fascist state is upon us. And yet, it doesn't have to be like this. The real power is with the many, not the few. Indeed infinite power is within every individual. The reason we are so controlled is not twelve. That we don't have the power to decide our own destiny, it is that we give that power away every minute of our lives. When something happens that we don't like, we look for someone else to blame. When there is a problem in the world, we say what are they going to do about it? At which point they, who have secretly created the problem in the first place, respond to this demand by introducing a solution, more centralization of power and erosion of freedom. If you want to give more powers to the police, security agencies and military, and you want the public to demand you do it, then ensure there is more crime, violence and terrorism, and then it's a cinch to achieve your aims. Once the people are in fear of being burgled, mugged or bombed, they will demand that you take their freedom away to protect them from what they have been manipulated to fear. The Oklahoma bombing is a classic of this kind, as I detail in and the truth shall set you free. I call this technique problem reaction solution. Create the problem, encourage the reaction something must be done, and then offer the solution. It is summed up by the Freemason motto Ordo Abjel, order out of chaos. Create the chaos and then offer the way to restore order. Your order. The masses are herded and directed by many and various forms of emotional and mental control. It is the only way it could be done. The few can't control billions of people physically, just as farm animals cannot be controlled physically unless a large number of people are involved. Two pigs escaped from a slaughterhouse in England and eluded capture for so long, despite the efforts of many people to catch them, that they became national celebrities. Physical control of the global population cannot work. But it is not necessary when you can manipulate the way people think and feel to the point where they decide to do what you want them to do anyway and demand that you introduce laws that you want to introduce. It is an old, old adage that if you want someone to do something, get them to believe it is their idea. Humanity is mind controlled and only slightly more conscious than your average zombie. Far fetched? No. Number one define mind control as the manipulation of someone's mind so that they think, and therefore act, the way you want them to. Under this definition, the question is not how many people are mind controlled, but how few are not. Everyone is to a larger or lesser extent. When you are persuaded by advertising or hype to buy something you don't really need or want, you are being mind controlled. When you read or hear a slanted news story and allow it to affect your perception of a person or event, you are being mind controlled. Look at the training for the armed forces. It is pure mind control. From day one you are told to take orders without question and if some burke in a peaked cap tells you to shoot people you have never met and know nothing about, you must shoot without question. This is the yes sir. Mentality and it pervades the non-military world, also. Well, I know it's not right, but the boss told me to do it and I had no choice. No choice? We never have no choice. We have choices we would like to make and choices we would rather less like to make. But we never have no choice. To say so is another cop-out. The list of mind manipulating techniques is endless. They want your mind because when they have that, they have you. The answer lies in taking our minds back, thinking 13. 
for ourselves and allowing others to do the same without fear of ridicule or condemnation for the crime of being different. If we don't do that, the agenda I am going to outline will be implemented. But if we do regain control of our minds and achieve mental sovereignty, the agenda cannot happen because the foundation of its existence will have been taken away. I've talked and researched in more than 20 countries and I see the same process in every one of them. Identical policies and structures are introduced in line with a global agenda, yet at the same time there is quite obviously a global awakening as more and more people hear the spiritual alarm clock and emerge from their mental and emotional slumbers, the terrestrial trance. Which force will prevail in these millennium years to 2012? That is up to us. We create our own reality by our thoughts and actions. If we change our thoughts and actions we will change the world. It's that simple. In this book I am going to chart the history of the interbreeding tribe of bloodlines which control the world today and reveal the true nature of the global agenda. And I would emphasize that I am exposing an agenda, not a conspiracy as such. The conspiracy comes in manipulating people and events to ensure the agenda is introduced. These conspiracies take three main forms, conspiring to remove people and organizations that are a threat to the agenda, the assassination of Diana, Princess of Wales, conspiring to put people into positions of power who will make the agenda happen, George Bush, Henry Kissinger, Tony Blair, et at, and conspiring to create events which will make the public demand the agenda is introduced through problem reaction solution, wars, terrorist bombs economic collapses. In this way all these apparently unconnected events and manipulations become aspects of the same conspiracy to introduce the same agenda. In the months and years that follow, every time you pick up a paper, turn on the television or hear a speech from a political or business leader, you are going to see the information outlined here coming to pass. You already can if you understand the scam. Look at my previous books like. And the truth shall set you free. I am me I am free, the robots rebellion, the video turning of the tide, and the work of other researchers over decades and you will see that what was predicted is happening. This is not prophecy, it is merely the prior knowledge of the agenda. So will the global fascist state be realized in the next few years? That question can only be answered by another, are we going to become people or continue as sheeple? The agenda depends on the latter. Warning. There is an enormous amount of challenging information in this book. Please do not continue if you are dependent on your present belief system, or if you feel you cannot cope emotionally with what is really happening in this world. If you do choose to continue, remember there is nothing to fear. Life is forever and everything is just an experience on the road to enlightenment. Viewed from the highest level of perception, there is no good and evil. Only consciousness making choices to experience all there is to experience. The astonishing events which this book exposes are in the process of coming to an end as the light of freedom dawns at last on the biggest transformation of consciousness this planet has seen in 26,000 years. It is, despite some of the information you are about to read, a wonderful time to be alive. David K. 14 1. Chapter 1. The Martians have landed. There were two ways of writing this book. I could have held back information which is stunningly bizarre, but true. This would be the easy way, staying within the comfort zone and communicating only that which would not challenge too many people's sense of possibility. Or I could treat the readers like fully formed, fully connected, multi-dimensional, adult human beings and communicate all the relevant information including some which will stretch their sense of reality to break in point. As always, I have chosen the latter. It is not for me to edit information for the readers, it is for the readers to edit the information for themselves. How arrogant and patronizing to think that I should keep information back from people because they're not ready for it. Who am I to decide that? And how can I know if they are ready for it unless they hear it and can therefore decide for themselves? Some of my friends have urged me to tell people the basic story, but for God's sake don't mention the reptiles. You will see what they mean by that very shortly. I understand their concern, but I can only be myself. And I have to tell all that I know and not only that which maintains the comfort zone. That's just me, 
the way I am. Of course the theme of the book will attract ridicule from those with a vision of possibility the size of a p and, naturally, from those who know it to be true and don't want the public to believe it. But so what? Who cares? I don't. As Kandai said, even if you are in a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. So here's the story, punches unpulled. In summary, a race of interbreeding bloodlines, a race within a race in fact, were centered in the Middle and Near East in the ancient world and, over the thousands of years since, have expanded their power across the globe. A crucial aspect of this has been to create a network of mystery schools and secret societies to covertly introduce their agenda while, at the same time, creating institutions like religions to mentally and emotionally imprison the masses and set them at war with each other. The hierarchy of this tribe of bloodlines is not exclusively male and some of its key positions are held by women. But in terms of numbers it is overwhelmingly male and I will therefore refer to this group as the Brotherhood. Even more accurately, given the importance of ancient Babylon to this story, I will also call it the Babylonian Brotherhood. The plan they term their creed work of ages, I will call the Brotherhood Agenda. The present magnitude of brotherhood control did not happen in a few years, even a few decades or centuries, it can be traced back thousands of years. The structures of today's institutions in two government, banking, business, military and the media have not been infiltrated by this force, they were created by them from the start. The brotherhood agenda is, in truth, the agenda of many millennia. It is the unfolding of a plan piece by piece, for the centralized control of the planet. The bloodline hierarchy at the top of the human pyramid of control and suppression passes the baton across the generations, mostly sons following fathers. The children of these family lines who are chosen to inherit the baton are brought up from birth to understand the agenda and the methods of manipulating the great work into reality. Advancing the agenda becomes their indoctrinated mission from very early in their lives. By the time their turn comes to join the brotherhood hierarchy and carry the baton into the next generation, their upbringing has molded them into highly imbalanced people. They are intellectually very sharp, but with a compassion bypass and an arrogance that they have the right to rule the world and control the ignorant masses who they view as inferior. Any brotherhood children who threaten to challenge or reject that mold are pushed aside or dealt with in other ways to ensure that only safe people make it to the upper levels of the pyramid and the highly secret and advanced knowledge that is held there. Some of these bloodlines can be named. The British House of Windsor is one of them, so are the Rothschilds, the European royalty and aristocracy, the Rockefellers and the rest of the so-called Eastern Establishment of the United States which produces the American presidents, business leaders, bankers and administrators. But at the very top, the cabal which controls the human race operates from the shadows outside the public domain. Any group which is so imbalanced as to covet the complete control of the planet will be warring within itself as different factions seek the ultimate control. This is certainly true of the Brotherhood. There is tremendous internal strife, conflict and competition. One researcher described them as a gang of bank robbers who all agree on the job, but then argue over how the spoils will be divided. That is an excellent description and through history different factions have gone to war with each other for dominance. In the end, however, they are united in their desire to see the plan implemented and at the key moments they overwhelmingly join forces to advance the agenda when it comes under challenge. You will probably have to go back hundreds of thousands of years to find the starting point of this story of human manipulation and of the family lines which orchestrate the great work. The more I have researched this over the years, the more obvious it has become to me that the origin of the bloodlines and the plan for the takeover of the Earth goes off-planet to a race or races from other spheres or dimensions of evolution. Extraterrestrial as we call them. If you doubt the existence of extraterrestrial life then consider this for a moment. Our Sun is only one of some 100 billion stars in this galaxy alone. Sir Francis Crick, the Nobel Laureate says there are an estimated 100 billion galaxies in our universe and he believes there are at least 1 million planets in our galaxy that could support life as we know it. Think of what the figure might be for the entire universe, 
even before we start looking at other dimensions of existence beyond the frequency range of our physical senses. If you traveled at the 3 speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, it would take you 4.3 years to reach the nearest star to this solar system. It says much for humanity's level of indoctrination that to speak of extraterrestrial life is to appear cranky, yet to dismiss it and suggest that life has only emerged on this one tiny planet is considered credible. You only have to consider the amazing structures that abounded in the ancient world to see that an advanced race existed then. We are told that only people primitive in comparison to modern humans lived in these times, but that is patently ludicrous. Like most official thinking the historical and archaeological establishment makes up its own stories, calls them proven facts, and simply ignores the overwhelming evidence that they are wrong. The idea is not to educate, but to indoctrinate. Anyone who doesn't conform to the official line of history is isolated by their fellow historians and archaeologists who either know their jobs, reputations and funding are safer when they stick to the official version, or, frankly, they cannot see beyond the end of their noses. The same can be said of most people in the teaching and intellectual professions. All over the planet are fantastic structures built thousands of years ago which could only have been created with technology as good as often even better than, we have today. At Baalbek, northeast of Beirut in the Lebanon, three massive chunks of stone, each weighing 800 tons, were moved at least a third of a mile and positioned high up in a wall. This was done thousands of years BC. Another block nearby weighs 1,000 tons, the weight of three jumbo jets. How was this possible? Official history does not wish to address such questions because of where it might lead. Can you imagine ringing a builder today and asking him to do that? You want me to do what? He would say, you're crazy. In Peru are the mysterious Nazca lines. The ancients scored away the top surface of the land to reveal the white subsurface and through this method were created incredible depictions of animals, fish, insects and birds. Some of them are so large they can only be seen in their entirety from 1,000 feet in the air. The knowledge which allowed wonders like Nazca, Baalbek, the Great Pyramid at Giza and other amazing creations to be built with such precision and scale, came from an advanced race who, in ancient times, lived among a far more primitive general population. This race is described as the gods in the Old Testament texts in other works and in oral traditions of antiquity. I can hear followers of the Bible denying that their book speaks of the gods. But it does. When the word God is used in the Old Testament it is often translated from a word that means gods, plural, Elohim and Adam I are two examples. You can easily understand that a race performing technological feats of such magnitude should be seen as gods by a people unable to comprehend such abilities. In the 1930s, American and Australian servicemen landed their planes in remote parts of New Guinea to drop supplies for their troops. The locals, who had never seen a plane, believed the servicemen were gods and they became a focus of religious beliefs. This would have been even more extreme in the ancient world had their advanced race been beings from other planets, stars or dimensions, flying craft more advanced than anything flown, at least officially, by today's military. An influx of knowledge from outside this planet or another source would explain so many of the mysteries that official history greets with four. A deafening silence. The incredible feats of building also become explainable and so does the mystery of why early civilizations like Egypt and Sumer, the land of Shinar and the Bible, began at the peak of their development and then fell into decay, when the normal course of evolution is to start at a lower level and slowly advance through learning and experience. There was clearly an infusion of highly advanced knowledge that was later lost to most people. In every culture throughout the world are ancient stories and texts which describe the gods who brought this advanced knowledge. This would again explain the mystery of how the ancients had a phenomenal understanding of astronomy. There are endless legends all over the world of a time they call the Golden Age, which was destroyed by cataclysm and the fall of man. The ancient Greek poet, Huslut, described the world before the fall. Men lived like gods, without vices or passions vexation or toil. In happy companionship with divine beings, 
extraterrestrials? They pass their days in tranquility and joy, living together in perfect equality, united by mutual confidence and love. The earth was more beautiful than now, and spontaneously yielded an abundant variety of fruits. Human beings and animals spoke the same language and conversed with each other, telepathy. Men were considered mere boys at a hundred years old. They had none of the infirmities of age to trouble them and when they passed to regions of superior life, it was in a gentle slumber. 1. Utopian as that may sound, there are countless stories from every ancient culture which describe the world in the distant past in those terms. We can recreate that vision again if only we change the way we think and feel. The most comprehensive accounts of an advanced race are contained in tens of thousands of clay tablets found in 1850 about 250 miles from Baghdad, Iraq, by an Englishman Sir Austin Henry Lard as he excavated the site of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. This was located near the present Iraqi town of Mosul. Other finds have followed in this region which was once called Mesopotamia. The original source of this knowledge was not the Assyrians, but the Sumerians who lived in the same area from, it is estimated, 4000 to 2000 BC. I will refer to the clay tablets, therefore, as the Sumerian texts or tablets. They are one of the greatest historical finds imaginable and yet 150 years after they were discovered they are still ignored by conventional history and education. Why? Because they demolish the official version of events. The most famous translator of these tablets is the scholar and author Zechariah Sitchin, who can read Sumerian, Aramaic, Hebrew and other Middle and Near Eastern languages. Too, he has extensively researched and translated the Sumerian tablets and has no doubt that they are describing extraterrestrials. Some researchers say that he used a later version of the Sumerian language to translate an earlier one and, therefore, some of his translations may not be 100% accurate. I think his themes are correct, indeed other accounts and evidence supports this, but I personally doubt some of the detail. I think that a number of Sitchin's interpretations are extremely questionable, while I agree with the overall thesis. According to his five figure two, the solar system showing the location of the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter which, though the details vary, many ancient and modern accounts suggest is the remains of a planet or part of a planet translations, and others, the texts say that the Sumerian civilization, from which many features of modern society derive, was a gift from the gods. Not mythical gods, but physical ones who lived among them. The tablets call these gods the Ki, those who from heaven to earth came, and Indotgur, the righteous ones of the blazing rockets. The name of Sumer itself was Ki.N.Gur the land of the Lord of the Blazing Rockets and also land of the Watchers, according to Sitchin. The ancient text known as the Book of Enoch also calls the gods the Watchers, as did the Egyptians. The Egyptian name for their gods, the Neteru, literally translates as Watchers and they said that their gods came in heavenly boats. According to Zechariah Sitchin, the tablets describe how the Anunnaki came from a planet called Nibiru, the planet of the crossing which he believes has a 3,600-year elliptical orbit that takes it between Jupiter and Mars and then out into far space beyond Pluto. Modern science had identified a body it calls Planet X which has been located beyond Pluto and is believed to be part of this solar system. But an elliptical orbit would be incredibly unstable and difficult to sustain. Scientists I trust believe that Sitchin is mistaken in his Nibiru theory though his main themes about the Anunnaki are correct. The Sumerian tablets, from Sitchin's translations, describe how, during the early formation of the solar system, Nibiru caused the near destruction of a planet that once existed between Jupiter and Mars. The Sumerians called it Tiamat, a planet they nicknamed the Watery Monster. They say that it was debris from Tiamat's collision with the Nibiru moon which created the Great Band Bracelet, the asteroid belt which is found between Mars and Jupiter. What remained of Tiamat was thrown into another orbit, the texts say, and eventually it became the Earth, see figure 2. The Sumerian name for the Earth means the cleaved one because a vast hole was created, they say, by the collision. 
Interestingly if you take away the water and the Pacific Ocean you will be left with a gigantic hole. 6. The tablets are the written accounts of oral traditions that go back enormous amounts of time and you have to be careful that details have not been added or lost and that we don't take symbolism or parable as literal truth. I am sure that some confusion did occur in this way. I have doubts myself about the Nibiru Tiamat scenario and its alleged time scale. But there is much truth in the texts which can be proven, not least in their knowledge of astronomy. The tablets depict the solar system with the planets in their correct positions, orbits and relative sizes, and their accuracy has only been confirmed in the last 150 years since some of these planets have been found. The tablets describe the nature and color of Neptune and Uranus in ways that have only been confirmed in the last few years. What's more, the modern experts did not expect those planets to look as they did, yet the Sumerians knew thousands of years BC what our advanced science has only just discovered. Most stunning about the Sumerian tablets is the way they describe the creation of Homo sapiens. Sitchin says the Anunnaki came to the Earth an estimated 450,000 years ago to mine gold in what is now Africa. The main mining center was in today's Zimbabwe, an area the Sumerians called Abdotzu, deep deposit, he claims. Studies by the Anglo-American Corporation have found extensive evidence of gold mining in Africa at least 60,000 years ago, probably 100,000.3 the gold me.